there was a platform and the camera operator, Polly, was underneath the platform looking up at me and I was just stabbing a piece of wood. And that was really fun. Uh, if you get to stab something that isn't a person, uh, you know, you can really go to town. Please welcome John Carroll Lynch. <laughs> Grab a microphone. Yeah, sure. All right, here's good. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, thanks for coming. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. This is so wonderful. Pleasure. Yeah. So uh, we're going to hopefully get some questions from the audience, but sure. I've got a couple right off the bat. Okay. I mean, from Norm Gunderson and Fargo to uh, Steve Carey and the Drew Carey Show to Twisty the Clown. How do you manage to get such a wide variety of characters? How do you make that all happen? Uh, people ask me. That's the <laughs> primary. Uh, the primary gift is people ask me to do the work. Um, I, I love. I love the opportunity to play different people. That's that's why I got into this. Uh, was to experience what it is to be someone else in, in an imaginary circumstance for periods of time. And so uh, I've, been, I've had the good fortune of not um, being in a situation where I would have to play the same person over and over again. Uh, I, mean, that's, I mean, character actors as a, as a word is kind of based on a system in the, you know, the studio system where People would be cast in the same kinds of roles over and over again. There's wonderful versions of that, like Edward Arnold, who's in Meet John Doe, for example. He plays that kind of part over and over again. You'll see him 50, 60 times in the same kind of part. Um, it was only later that people started to kind of be able to switch it up. And uh, I'm grateful to not have been caught in a cycle of playing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. And also, I got to ask, with the character Twisty the Clown, I mean, there's a lot of graceful movements. It's, it's, was there any choreography or any mime training that you had for that specific role? I, uh, uh, to begin, I, I did a lot of balloon animals. Not that it was ever used in the thing, but I, I made a lot of balloon animals. Uh, no, you know, the, the movement was very much based on conversations uh, and also watching Ryan Murphy. Um, the best way to take a note for me is to watch the director give it because their body will reflect what they want you to do often more than their, their words will or in combination. And a lot of the movement was really something that Ryan was trying to get to. Um, that scene is a really I mean, it's an amazing scene. It's really a, a scene that quotes a scene from the film Zodiac, almost shot for shot. And uh, the Lake Berryessa murders, and um, I'm I you know we were we made the thing, and then I saw it, and I was like, this scene looks really familiar to me. Uh, yeah, but I wasn't there when they shot the Lake Berryessa murders, uh, uh, because the because the way Fincher shot the movie, there were various people who were at the murder scenes of the, of the Zodiac, and I was at none of them, so it was funny to watch a. Uh, um, a scene that was being quoted where the character I played allegedly was there. It was very strange. But it was also fun. It was quite warm that day. It was in New Orleans, and it was um, very hot, and I was essentially in a silk bag. So uh, not, not, not extremely comfortable. How many takes did it get to make that happen? Oh, That's perfect. I mean, they move very quickly on uh, American Horror Story. They have to, but I mean, they, we did as many. It wasn't too many. Uh, certainly a lot of angles. There's a lot of shots in the, in the sequence. And um, as you can see, a lot of them are from a steady cam. But the funny one for me was when I was actually stabbing. Um, there was a platform, and the camera operator, Polly, was underneath the platform looking up at me, and I was just stabbing a piece of wood. And that was really fun. Uh, if you get to stab something that isn't a person, uh, you know, you can really go to town. I guess you can with a person too, but it, the cleanup's a lot worse. 
So you worked with a, a wide variety of directors, obviously Ryan Murphy, Coen Brothers, Clint Eastwood, to name. Uh, so how did you learn much from them to, into your directing style? Did you learn much from them into your direction style? Uh, I, I, I learned tons from everybody I've worked with. Uh, the primary thing that I've learned from great directors is they create an atmosphere of play and creativity that you feel safe in. Um, it's a very vulnerable act to, uh, a process to act in front of a camera or on stage. It's very uh, vulnerable. So um, when, when you feel safe with the director is when you're able to uh, be your most creative self. And all the great ones, in different ways, uh, create, create a circumstance in which you feel like you're, you're all going in the right direction. So I gotta ask you about your film, Lucky. You directed Harry Dean Stanton. That was his last film, I believe. Close to, yeah. he did a little bit of work after that, but yeah, it was close to his last film. And David Lynch was in Can you tell how that came about and working with them? A friend of mine who co-wrote the script called me and said, would you be interested in reading this script? So I read it. We met for coffee, and he said, would you play the diner owner in it? And I said, yeah. Uh, three days with Harry sounds great to me. And then about two months later, he, he knew I was working to, to find a project to direct. He said, listen, our director, we're just having trouble getting him on the phone. He's very busy, and, and we want an actor to direct this movie. Would you be interested in directing it? And I said, well, yeah, well, let me read it again, and then we can have a chat. So... I was in Atlanta at the time shooting The Founder, and uh, I was in a laundromat, which I later realized was the same laundromat they shot Baby Driver in. Um, when I saw that movie, I was like, oh, I was doing my laundry in there. Um, <laughs> um, but we had a chat. The co-writers and I had a chat, and uh, I said, this is what I think your movie is about, and this is how I would approach it, and what, what I think is missing in the script, and what... What, and so we worked on the script for a little bit, but they already had Harry attached. Yeah. Um, Harry had agreed to do the movie. I don't think he actually believed we were ever going to get it done, frankly. A lot of these things, you know, they don't ever actually come to fruition. So when it finally looked like it was going to be done and we found the financing, and, you know, a good thing for financing is to say to the financiers, we have an 89-year-old actor, so a quick no is absolutely fine. You know, just let us move on so we can get mm -hmm. the money together before um, he dies. <laughs> and uh, it was a very quick process, very fast for independent films. Independent films can last, you know, process can last five, six, ten years. Uh, this one was about, from the time I read the script to the time we finished shooting was about a year. And um, David came along because Harry was in it. And, uh, uh, but we had to, we had some scheduling that we had to do with David, but he was always on board and the rest of the cast turned out great. And, uh, but everybody came for Harry, you know, everybody came to work with Harry Dean as I had. So that's kind of how it came together. Uh, yeah. Did you have much work to do editing wise or just kind of watch over someone's shoulder or? Uh, editing is an interesting process that I'd never done before, and I realized for myself, I, I've learned that what I'm going to do the next time is uh, watch the editor edit, like I watch an actor act, uh, and uh, ask him where, you know, the best time I had was when I was watching the editor, and I said, where are you going with this? And he said, well, I think this is the point of the scene. I said, mm, no, I don't think so. And we would talk about it, and then he would cut it, and then we would discuss whether or not the cut did the work. And, uh, and it was really, when, once I figured that out, that was really fun. Um, but no, as far as the editing was concerned, it was a very tight uh, project. We shot it in 18 days. And, um, and I mean, what you see on the screen is, I mean, it's not everything that we shot, but it's pretty much everything we shot. And uh, there were definitely places in the edit that was like, do you have three more frames of this? Can I have, can I have five more frames? No, this is it? Okay, <laughs> well then. But I, I loved the process of the editing in the post, which was my first time doing it. Um, and uh, what, what you realize is you're, you're asking a question which I hadn't thought of before, which is how, do I lo how long do I want the audience to think about this? 
until they move on to something else. And you're just guessing what they're going to think. But it's fun to play, play with that. I loved, I loved doing that. It's, 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 um, it's an attractive process. If you can find ways to do it more often than I've, I've so far found ways to do it. Uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Just raise your hand and Kyle will come over and get you. Oh, you had mentioned the founder. Could you talk about any cool stories on that shoot? It's such a great movie. I love the movie. Uh, it turned out great. John Lee Hancock is an incredibly good director, and uh, I recommend the wor other work that he's done. Uh, he's always a uh, he works in this. He has worked in the studio system, but he makes studio movies that mean something. They're not just simply entertainment. He always finds a way to land a point, and that movie is no um, exception. Um, I had worked with Michael before. Um, I think this was the second time I'd worked with him. I did a movie called Live from Baghdad. And uh, uh, it was great to work with him again and to get a sense of, an, uh, to get more time with him individually in scenes and with, with Nick Offerman, who's a genius. And um, I loved the story. Um, and I loved playing a guy who loved his brother so much. Um, one of the interesting things about that shoot that I liked was um, John Lee made two sets right next to each other for the phone calls. So our office was on a soundstage right next to um, Ray Kroc's office. So we shot the phone calls live um, with one camera on one set and one camera on the other, uh, which was the first time I'd ever seen that done. And it was really great. It was, uh, if you can afford it, it's a really good way to make uh, do phone calls. I've, I've acted in phone calls before. Uh, most of the time, you're just off, off camera. I have phoned it in a couple of times, literally, <laughs> like where you're on a phone. And one time I was sitting by my, in my backyard uh, on the phone at about eight at night with my acting partner on a set somewhere. But that almost never works because cell coverage and, you know, just never really works. But it did that time, and it was really wild to be sitting there acting in a film while I'm just sitting at home. Okay. Question over there. I don't have a question, but I have a very shy four-year-old that would like to have a hug. If, if that's all right with him, I'm okay with it, too. Yeah, sure. What's, the, what's, your, what's your name? Which, can you tell him your name? His name's Marshall, and you are the Hi, reason Marshall. we're here. Uh, I can hold your mic. Thanks. Hmm? Oh, that's nice. Oh, and he even has a twisty shirt. How are you, buddy? Oh, there you go, buddy. There you go. <laughs> Aw. Aw. That's a nice thing to... Nice to meet you, Marshall. There you go. It's nice to meet you. That was very brave of you. Yeah. <laughs> and a question back there. Thank you. Okay. Most people probably know you as drama and everything else. I was raised on Comedy Central, so I know you as the iconic polyamorous father, Morton Livingston from Bubble Boy. Do you have any memories of working with like Vern Troyer and Danny Trejo? I mean, it was a cool cast. It was a really fun cast and... Uh, uh, and it was a really fun movie to make. Um, I was, I think it's a really good movie too, but it was a funny circumstance. We came out, we were coming out, you know, we had a, it was a really big like premiere party where it was a lot of bubble gum and stuff like that. Everything that had bubbles, there were bubble, bubble machines and everything was bubble. But um, they had the filmmakers on the Today Show when Katie Couric was on and uh, the first question she asked was, why are you making a comedy about a dangerous and debilitating terminal disease? And um, the director's honest answer would have been, I'm not. He doesn't have it. But you can't say that because that's the surprise at the end. So they ended up having to try to awkwardly defend a movie they didn't make. <laughs> you know? And it really, really damaged the movie's box office. 
But the movie's really funny. Uh, Blair Hayes is the guy who directed it, and um, I don't know if you know Schmigadoon. Do you know that television series? This is, Cinco Paul was one of the writers on Bubble Boy, and he actually made a musical of Bubble Boy as well. Um, so on the set, um, after we finally caught up with Jake Gyllenhaal's character, our son, uh, and I have said nothing in the film. Um, I don't know why people don't want me to talk. <laughs> anyway, um, so I have a, a scene with him, how, how was it on the road? And, um, and he told me, and uh, we were sitting in the car and through the windshield, I said to Blair, I said, Blair, you see, you can see the moon today. And he goes, oh yeah. And I said, wouldn't it be great if, if uh, the dad said, you know, like, I wonder what would have happened if, uh, our, uh, you know, Armstrong had gone all the way to the moon and not stepped off. Which would be, you know, to give him permission to keep going. And Blair thought about it and Cinco thought about it and said, ah, that's great. Well, let's try one. Let's do that. So they took a shot through the windshield so we could, you know, have a point of view. And it ended up in the movie. And it not only ended up in the movie, but in Cinco Paul's musical version, there's a song called You Can See the Moon Today. And uh, who Richard Kind played the part in the musical and uh, sang that song. I really loved, I really loved that movie. F final Bubble Boy, well, I mean, not a final Bubble Boy, sorry. But, so at the end, we did the reshoot where there, there's the wedding scenes. And that's where the polyamory <laughs> came in. And it was Susie and I and uh, Danny. And uh, when I was getting on the bike with Danny Trejo, he goes, Scooch up, man. I've been in prison. <laughs> All right. Grab another question right down there. Do you have any stories from uh, the Drew Carey show that you can share with us? Uh, the Drew Carey show was such a wonderful um, experience. They called me up and offered me the part. I think it was one of my first offers, frankly. And they said, they want you to play Drew Carey's brother. I said, great. And he goes, and just to let you know, he's a cross-dresser. And I said, oh, even better. <laughs> so the first week we do, you know, makeup and hair and wardrobe fittings and stuff to make sure what, what the look of this character is going to be. And I was uh, in the, you know, generally the final look for the cross-dressing portion of the, of the, uh, the episode. And um, I was, you know, with the heels and the hair, I was about seven feet tall. And uh, Clay Graham was one of the executive producers. And I was walking back to the wardrobe um, room to take it all off. And um, I overheard him talking to the wardrobe supervisor and costume designer and like, I think we might want to lose the, the, you know, the shoulder pads in that dress because it's really like it's makes him look really big. And I overheard it and I turned around and said, you can't lose the shoulder pads because it'll totally ruin the line of the dress. And also it'll give me rounded shoulders, which are very masculine, which is not the point of cross-dressing at all. You know, the point of cross-dressing is to, you know, try to create a feminine look. And that's more like a Joan Crawford kind of, you know, silhouette. And I'm talking to Clay, and Clay was about 5'4", is about 5'4". And I see him doing this. Uh-huh. Okay. 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 Good. And I realized I'm towering over him. So I say, thanks, great. And I'm walking away, and I get about 10, 10 feet away, and he goes, you're getting way too into this, man. I mean, if you're going to do it, you know... You got to go all the way out on the beam. You got to, yeah. You can't, can't not. Um, it was uh, that season. The character was nominated for a, a Glad Award, uh, and uh, and it's a it's a part I would never be cast in now. Um, but the the spectrum of why people choose to wear different clothing goes all the way from you know transgender and and people who want to transition all the way to a wide variety of other, uh, other relationships with grooming. And um, I don't know, I, I find the whole thing fascinating because 
actors have been doing that for a long time for various reasons. Mostly for comedy, crass comedy. And that was one of the things I liked about the character, it wasn't crass comedy. He was fully committed. So th th it went well, and then they started bringing me back for a couple of other episodes. And uh, we had an episode where I had a date with Mimi, and the minute that happened, I mean, the studio audience was like, oh, this has got legs. They were, they were so, it was hilarious. Their response was hilarious. You know, most of the time, uh, how many people have been to a, a sitcom uh, taping? Okay, one person. So let me describe to you a sitcom taping because it's really weird. Imagine this is the stage. It's much bigger and they're, they're laid out one next to the other are all the sets of the Drew Carey show. The backyard, the house, uh, Winfred Lauder, and then on the other end is the Dresden. So they had all four main sets lined up. And then there's an alley where all of the cameras sit. And then the audience is on little scaffold, kind of up behind the cameras, and there's a row of televisions. So what they're really watching is the show. I mean, they can see us, but we might as well be in Asia. We're, we're, we're so far away from them. It's a really weird thing to perform because you're getting kind of a slightly delayed response, but you're live. You know, you're playing like you would on stage in a way, but it's being filmed, so it's a weird hybrid to work. So the minute I kissed Mimi in that episode, dressed as a woman, I kissed her, the audience just exploded. And it, I mean, they would not, the first time, they would not quiet down. They thought it was hilarious. And it went for a while. And you know, you, on stage you're kind of gauging, well, when can I start again? It was a long, long time before we could go again. There's this weird, awkward pause where you have nothing to play because you know, they didn't think it was gonna be that big a response and it was huge. Uh, and then I was asked to join the show. And then they tested that, the episodes, which they hadn't done until then. And they call me in the summer and say, yeah, we're gonna lose the dresses. It turns out America doesn't really like those. Um, so the dresses were gone. Um, and it was always a struggle after that to find out who he was. Um, I love being on the show. It was the funniest group of people. They were funny all the time. And I, I, I mean, it was a joyful time. And I also had a great opportunity to go do other things while I was doing that show, which was very special. All right, next question. Hi, yeah. On the third season of Frasier, the original one, Shelley Long, Diane writes a play. Yeah. And it's a bar. It's the whole recreation. And you're like the Frasier character, Franklin. Yeah. Was that fun to do, kind was, of being Frasier in a way? <laughs> it was. Um, it was my first job in Los Angeles. I had come, uh, I had done Fargo. I had done other films and stuff, but they were all in Minnesota. And I had moved to Los Angeles a little bit before Fargo was going to come out in anticipation of, you know, capitalizing on that shit, on that movie coming out. And I got that job. Uh, and um, I got the call to go in and audition. And I did a pre-audition with the casting directors. And then I got called back and uh, back to Paramount. And it started to kind of group up. There were four of everybody from the Cheers, four people vying for the part on, in the play that you know, were representing the various Cheers characters. And um, the casting director came out and said, I'm sorry, Christopher Lloyd, the, not the actor, but the creator, he was in a car accident. He's fine, but it slowed him down. I'm really sorry it's backed up like this, but he's gonna be in in a few minutes. And work starts today on this, so if it's okay, we're gonna, you know, do the four uh, choices, and if you could go into the lobby and wait, and we'll just tell one of you to move your car onto the lot. <laughs> so each of us goes in, and we're all standing in the, lo in the lobby of the building at Paramount. Well, this is really weird, all of us uh, uh, sitting here. 
And then they came out, uh, the casting director came out and said, thanks everybody. John, you can move your, ca your car onto the lot. You don't normally get to see the disappointment of the other actors <laughs> face to face. And I would have felt the same. So we started work that day and um, it, was, it was my first job in Los Angeles. So what, it was a nice job to do. And uh, Jim Burroughs was directing it, who had directed both Frasier and Cheers. So um, it was a, an amazing s a start. Um, and craft services on Frasier was awesome. So before we get to this question, I want to ask you, do you feel more comfortable with movies or television? Which one do you prefer doing? Which one do you feel more relaxed at? I, I, I mean, I like do uh, most, now that that four camera sitcom setup is not really available for work anymore because most sitcoms are single camera or hybrid shows. They don't have a live audience anymore. Um, it's, it seems out, it feels outdated somehow. People are just used, more used to, you know, what, what they call single camera. So it's not very different now. Um, there was something very special about show nights on that, on the Drew Carey show. There was an, there was an energy of a, of a, of a preview of a theatrical, um, of a theatrical experience. And that's how I started acting, was on stage. So that felt really good. Um, and, but film, film, each of them has a different kind of relationship to you, really. Like, um, when you go to see a play, uh, um, this isn't my thought, this was a casting director. When you go to see a play, you know you're in an audience of people. You know you're, you, I do too. I know I'm in an audience of people watching another person do something. But on, on film, it doesn't matter if there's one person or it's sold out, you are alone. And you are in the head of the, because they're so big, you're in the head of the performers. It, it, it's so intimate. You're, you're actually seeing something so intimately. But television, you're inviting those characters into your house. You're turning on your televisions, well not anymore at a particular time, but you're streaming them and you go, oh, I want to see more of this person in my house. Uh, that's why like when you, when, like, um, what's, her, what's her name? Susan Lucci, I, I, I don't think a lot of people knew her name was Susan Lucci for the first 20 years she was on that show. She was Erica Kane. And I mean, people, the characters' names, you'll remember a character's name on a television show more than you will on a, on a film. Because you'll go, what was the film about? Well, Brad Pitt was on this train. <laughs> you don't know the character's name of Brad, Brad Pitt's characters. I don't know the name of Brad Pitt's characters in, in, uh, in, on Bullet Train. I don't know. I don't know. And uh, I, my gauge of a really special performance on film is I remember the character's name. Um. What is your favorite character or part that you've ever played? I always say the next one. Uh, because that means I'm working. Um, but, I, I mean, I was really happy to play. There's some words that you're really happy to say. You know what I mean? Like, uh, the words I got to say on The Walking Dead were really special words. It was beautifully written. But also to say words like, we're not built to kill, uh, and all life is precious, are words that you don't have to, you just have to get out of the way of those words. And that's the joy when you, when you have a when you have, you're playing a scene in which you you just have to get out of the way. Uh, I love those um, pieces that you may be rare for you that may not you may not know about because they weren't um, you know distributed widely. There's a great movie called The Invitation by Karen Kusama, which I recommend. It's a spectacular film. And not everybody's seen it. You can find it streaming. Um, that's one I think everybody should see just because it's such a really good film. Um, and if you haven't seen Lucky, I'm, I'm really happy with the way that turned out. I'm not in it, but um, it's a really good movie. Actually, I have a question to follow up on your Walking Dead comments. 
How much training with staff work did you have to do in preparation of that role, and how was it working with Lenny and getting to kind of beat him up? <laughs> uh, working with Lenny is a joy. I, I've, I've rarely worked with actors who listen better than Lenny James does. He hears, he hears you, which is a great, it's part of his gift as an actor. Uh, it, was a, it was a really rare circumstance. Scott Gimple, who was the, at that time the showrunner for The Walking Dead, had started to conceive of that kind of backstory of Lenny's character, um, you know, a year before. And he started uh, putting things into scripts in, this, in the last half of the season, uh, the year before the episode was shot. And he would call, Lenny told me he would call him and go, yeah, you're going to have like a, you're going to have a rabbit's foot. It's going to mean something. Don't worry. I, I'm getting to that. But, you know, you're going to put it onto the altar. It's important. I, I can't tell you exactly what it means right now, but it's important. So, you know, or he, he, he did that, all, uh, you know, like the moon pies and stuff. Lenny would have these things that he would, that would harken back to an episode that hasn't even been written yet. So then he started writing the episode and I actually was offered the part while I was already in Atlanta working on the founder. And um, they set up the season so that the first, the, it was going to be the fourth episode of, the, of that season, but they shot it in the slot of the eighth episode. Because they, they take, they, they, when they were doing that show, they took a break between the two eight-episode blocks. So they gave everybody but Lenny time off at more time off. And uh, then uh, we shot the episode. So I came in and I had about... I might be hit. Uh, if you're, if you're I had about four... It's that one. I had about four days, of, four days or a week of training. Um, a gentleman who t trained me, terrific. He, tra he had trained Lenny as well. Um, but Lenny at that point had had four, three years or something, two, three years. So... Um, I was definitely behind, um, but the stunt coordinator and the you know Lenny were quite generous, um, and we we worked a, a lot on it. Even on the weekends, we did a couple of days where we 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 uh, met. Um, but the you know I want to say one thing about the show. So everybody was off except for Lenny. Um, and the first day of filming, Stephen Yuan and um, Lincoln came. Andy Lincoln came just to say hello, just to welcome me to the show before they flew off for their vacation. It was like, we want to welcome you to the show. We, you know, uh, we do this with everybody. Uh, and that kind of company, um, which that show was, is extremely rare. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why they, the acting on that show was so strong. Great, got a question over here. Hello, how are you? <laughs> uh, so, um, my understanding is that actors are lovers of words, and you can always tell which of their lines or the dialogue that they love, especially the parts they love. You can always tell when they do. And so, I've seen you do many things, you know, comedy and scary things, but all those characters are very eccentric, or they're they're neurotic, or they're, they're just different. And other than your next role, which types of character would you like to play, or do you enjoy playing the most? Um, at, at this point, uh, I, I want to go, you know, I am a, I love words and, you know, I grew up, I grew up, as I said, as an actor in the theater, I grew up doing Shakespeare. I was in a classical theater company at the Guthrie Theater for eight years. So I did a lot of Shakespeare, a lot of classic plays. And the primary um, venue of, of the theater and particularly classic plays is poetry, you know, of one type or another. So I, I always approach the, and anything I get, regardless of what it is, with a sense of poetry. It's just how I, was, how I grew up as an actor. Um, the silent characters that I've played have taught me more in some ways than the, the ones that uh, have words because they've taught me what's essential uh, about the communication on film. Uh, or, you know, in, I, we say film, but nobody shoots film. So, uh, uh, you know, on digital image. 
So um, I now look for what a thing says more than what the character is doing. You know? Um, I've been, because I've pretended to kill a lot of people, I'm, I, 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 <laughs> I get I get those roles offered to me a, a good amount, and I I struggle with that because I wonder if I'm not simply just aggrandizing violence, and uh, um, and I think I've done things that have glorified it, um, and I'm not really interested in that. Um, what I'd like to talk about is the cost of violence. Um, and when things have that, I am more interested in participating because I, I believe that I come to watch things because not only do I want to be entertained and moved, but I want to be thinking about what the artists are telling me about the human condition. And... Um, I mean, I think we're seeing a, a huge example of um, how a cycle of violence um, doesn't change anything. And the older I get, the more and more convinced I am that fear, that intimidation, that violence change no one. Love does. Love and humor change people. You can't... You can't um, once you empathize, you cannot take away a person's humanity. Once your heart is moved, you can't think of them as disposable. And um, I would prefer to do, whether or not there's violence or darkness, because darkness is a part of our lives, whether or not they're those things, if the heart of the thing gets us to empathize, gets us to feel, gets us to connect with the humanity, even of the perpetrators, then I, I, I can show up for that. Um, as, a, as a creator, which is what I'm, what I'm working on as a director, is creating things, there's virtually no violence in any of the things I want to create. As a matter of fact, the only, I, I have a, I, I'm working with a wonderful writer and actor on a, a comedy about domestic violence. And all of the violence happens before the movie starts. And it's about her and her father on a road trip back to Edmonton. And they're trying not to talk about her injuries. They're working really, really hard not to talk about their injuries. So they play, you know, highway games like license plate. And they talk about hockey because they're Canadians. And they talk about hockey and baseball. But eventually they get to, the, you know, the damage. Because the movie's not about what happened to her, it's about why she let it happen, why she didn't leave. I mean, she didn't let the violence happen, that's not my point, but she kept on going back to this guy. And that's what the movie's about. Like, why am I signing up for that? And I hope that when we get to the end of the movie, the audience goes, well, I mean, her dad's pretty emotionally unavailable. <laughs> so, you know. Maybe that was part of it, that she was chasing some kind of love that she did not get. I don't know. That's kind of what that story's about. So if it's about something, I want to do it. I guess that's the way I'd put it. If I can find the about something, I really get attracted. Whether or not I have to pretend to kill people or not. This is, this is coming out in 2024, what you're just talking about? No, I'm working on it, and we're looking for financing for that film. It's hilarious, by the way. It's really funny. Um, and hopefully at the end you'll have laughed and then it'll punch you right in the gut. That's the idea. So what's going on for 2024? Anything you can talk about? I mean, I have, I have three directing projects that I want to get off the ground. Nice. I'm hoping one of them will be in 2024. You never know. Um, uh, trying to get a, an independent film off the ground is trying, like trying to, is watching a baby walk. You know, it gets up, and it falls down. <laughs> it gets, uh, 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 uh. That's how, kind of how it feels. Um, those are three things. The strike has changed the, the landscape. Um, I don't have a job at the moment, um, but everything is starting up now. 
Um, we spent eight months on the line, six, six months on the line. I'm extremely proud of my fellow union members. How many people are members of unions here? Well, I'm extremely proud of you too, and even people who aren't in unions. We, we, um, we need to stick together. There's no other way to change things. Um, and our business is, was no different. Um, we needed to strike because without a strike, we wouldn't have s fundamentally changed our relationship to the work, which we did. Uh, but I'm excited to see what happens next. Uh, there's some things I've, I've been talking to people about. I got to do my first stage work in 15 years in a reading. I hope that play goes somewhere. Um, we'll see. Well, thank you so much for coming well, out. Oh, wait, wait, one, one more. more. All right. One more over here. Good. Hi, um, my name's Rachel. Uh, I'm looking forward to your next work. Thank you. Um, so in your career, you have played some wide ranges of roles, and I love seeing you in Zodiac, American Horror Story, The Invitation. Um, playing those roles can take a toll on anybody, as I can imagine. What do you do to help cope with such heavy roles? Um, they do. They, they, uh, look, I'm under no illusions that I'm capable of every human evil that is expressed in the world. I'm, I'm under no illusions that I am capable of all of it. So it doesn't, it doesn't go that far. If I really tear away the civil, civilized person that I'm trying to be, um, it wouldn't take long for me to, to um, reach a level of, uh, of that kind of intensity. Um, I'm grateful for civilization that we aren't doing that. But I... I, I uh, so in that way, I don't feel that scarred. I just simply accept the truth of my own humanity as much as deeply as I can. So that in real life, I don't do that. In real life, I strive for kindness, and I strive for presence, and I strive for listening. And even though I've talked for a long time, I strive for, you know, listening to others, not talking so much. Well, needless to say, thank you so much for coming out. He's headed back to his table. Can't thank you enough. John Carroll Lynch, give it up. You could do better than that. Headed back to his table to sign. Thank you so much. Cheers. This is Ross Marquand, and you are watching Fandom Spotlight, which is awesome. So, like, share and subscribe. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom.